Greetings and salutations, this is Emperor Arthur Vespasian and his trusty sidekick. Hello. We're going to be having a look today at our VDV infantry. Um, VDV stands for something in Russian, and it basically means paratroopers. However, um, in game terms, uh, we use a template of the guard stroke NKVD troops. Um, we don't have any NKVD troops, and guard troops look the same as any other unit, so you can use any unit for guards any unit for NKVD, and so VDV roughly classes the same. Um, so if you want to use Soviet paratroopers, then you can simply use the same, use the robot, use the same um, template for the um, NKVD troops or the guard. Um, in reality, they're all different units. Um, the main thing that may, would make paratroopers, Soviet paratroopers different would be an extra light machine gun. Uh, because they ca the units were issued with two light machine guns per 11-man squad. Uh, two light machine guns, um, I think four submachine guns. Uh, let's just check my list. Three submachine guns, an NCO with a submachine gun, uh, six rifles, uh, sorry, five rifles and two light machine guns would be a standard squad of the VDV troops. And as you know, if you saw that battle we did, um, they're very, very good when they hit. Yeah, but it's just good. machine gun, machine gun, machine gun. Them pins that you get from that, yeah, them deaths, They're really good. Um, figure wise, um, I did a lot of research into the VDV. Um, there very, f there's very little information out there about the Soviet paratroop car prior to the Second World War, um, because pretty much as the war broke out, they were wiped out. So. And they became regular infantry, the ones who survived. So um, there's very little information. However, I, uh, the uniforms tended to be green, light green overalls, uh, which is the colours you can see here. They wore a cap, um, very much like the normal side cap, the forage cap, which is the one the Russians have in the box set. So I've used the same forage cap, but I've painted it blue, which is the NKVD, uh, sorry, which is the paratroop colour. Also when they were jumping they wore this brown uh, so brown leather jumping cap with goggles. Um, so I've given some of them, I've given the one of the, the NCO there, uh, the, the, the second squad leader there, a couple he would be, and the machine gunner um, a brown cap with some goggles. I made the goggles by splitting a spear shaft very finely with a knife and then sticking the little circle I've made onto the front of the helmet. The helmet itself is a Greek hoplite helmet that I just cut the plume off. So it's a Greek hoplite helmet there with uh, basically two pieces of spear staff, staff shook, stuck on to make it look like a flying helmet with goggles. Um, was quite intensive which is why I only did two of them <laughs> because it was actually quite hard to do. Um, However, um, I realised the reason after we found it hard to model recently is because my eyes are completely knackered. Um, I had to go to the opticians and I now wear glasses, so... Um, like, like, it looks like a professor. Yeah, so clearly I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older. Uh, anyway, so that's how I made the figures. Um, they're just the standard Soviet figures, with just painted in green, uh, with the blue cap. They look rather strange, but that's the way they look, apparently. Um, the uniform was changed in 19, uh, very late 1941, um, shortly after Barbarossa. Um, I think some people were already using these, and they were sort of a camo smock with, that was in green, like tan green, uh, sorry, uh, khaki green, with um, black splodges all over it. Uh, and you will see that on snipers and things like that, in, uh, sniper models you can find. Um, and that's the smock that they wore. Um, I think usually they'll cl class as some sort of special force uniform or something. But in general, it, it was it was a camera smock issued to the parachute car. Um, right. So given that we're discussing VDV and not NKVD and guards, um, we do use the same template for the figures. So effectively, we just use them as guards or NKVD, but they can be dropped by parachute. Um, so we'll go into guards and uh, guard units tend to, to be just normal Soviet infantry who survived a battle. That's how simple it was. Um, if you survived a battle, you became a guards unit, pretty much. Um, 
like in the British infantry, uh, in some periods of history, the only way you got into the guards is by bombing the right town. It didn't matter what your combat experience was. Um, things change during warfare, obviously, and you start using better troops, but there we are. Um, NKVD troops were different. Um, we will discuss those in another video. Um, they were technically they're called the NKVD border guards. Um, they were really the Gestapo of the Soviet army. They worked directly for the or the SS, of course, SS. No, um, military of the SS. Yes, um, foreign SS. No. Um, so uh, the NKVD would usually be. Um, divided into either board guards who, who were really customs officials um, or so they weren't that good troops um, or uh, interior ministry troops which means they were very very good troops and very motivated um, these guys are paratroopers which is a completely different thing but we do use the same template I keep saying no. um, so um, the Soviet army had large numbers of paratroopers from at the outbreak of the second world war They'd been using them pretty much continuously from the war with China in 1936 all the way through to the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, the last time they were used really on the Western Front properly was trying to cross the Dnepr during the Soviet counter-offensive of 43, and they all got killed. So that was really the end of the parachute corps. They were reconstituted um, mainly as infantry units. Um, during the Soviet Union's early wars, remember the Soviet Union started fighting the war in 1937, so, um, you know, make of that what you will. Yeah, you could say that it started in 1920 when they invaded Poland, but I'm not getting too picky. Um, the Soviet Union um, battle tactic doctrine for parachutists was to drop them on enemy areas and raise hell. Um, very much like the British, uh, sorry, the, the, the German, uh, the German parachutists that they weren't designed to actually hold positions or capture things, they, they were designed to take out a particular thing and then just raise hell, just, just be, a, be really annoying. Uh, annoy the enemy, turn street signs backwards, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so the Soviet troops would be, parachutists would be dropped in usually prior to the invasion, usually the day before the invasion, or the, the night of an invasion, they would be dropped all over the place. They would link up with partisan units, um, soldiers who were loyal to the communist part, local communist party. So you take Finland or Latvia or any of those countries they invaded or southern Poland uh, before the Second World War, um, uh, Ukraine, um, places like that, and Bessarabia as well, another one. Um, they would drop the parachutists in the day before the attack. The parachutists would then link up with local people. They would cut lines of communication. They'd cut telegraph poles, uh, lines. That they'd do all sorts of annoying stuff. And then the army would invade, and there would already be troops behind the enemy lines causing really havoc. Help. Yeah, causing havoc. Um, didn't really work in Finland, uh, because Finland didn't have a particularly strong communist party. So, although there were communist agitators, Quite a few of them actually changed sides and reported on the Soviet plans. So that was quite useful for the Finns. Um, also, the areas where the Russians were invading, they weren't particularly high density population areas. So there weren't that many towns and stuff to actually infiltrate and get going. You, you'd get a dozen guys, local people loyal to the Russians, in a town of 300 people. You know, that's not going to really make any difference to the army. Um, also, all able-bodied men in Finland had been drafted into the main army by the, by the time the Soviets invaded. And that meant that any able-bodied men who were members of the Communist Party wouldn't be able to raise hell and, and join the resistance because they were already in uniform and the ones who weren't in uniform had already fled the country. So, and they were in the Soviet army anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, in 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, the paratroopers were caught on the ground. They didn't get time to be deployed. There were a few attempts to deploy 
um, them right up to the Battle of Slamen, so the first couple of months of the war, the, the Soviet Union tried to use paratroopers to land behind the Germans to cause havoc, as you said. Um, these attempts generally failed. Uh, they all failed, actually. Um, so there, there were attempts. Uh, the Soviet unit itself had massive amounts of aircraft to drop paratroopers troopers, right up until Barbarossa when most of the planes were caught on the ground and the Russians had probably about a hundred aircraft capable of actually carrying paratroopers. Most of their gliders were destroyed on the ground. In 1941, June 1941 they had 700 gliders to be used for dropping troops behind enemy lines. Um, all, nearly all the gliders were captured by the Germans, um, usually burnt. Um, so the Germans would strafe the airfields, all the gliders were stacked up and caught fire and burnt. Um, so they didn't really have a delivery system. So the, the Russians had to rely on literally standing on the wings of aeroplanes in order to drop behind enemy lines. So after that, um, paratroopers were used um, to support rear troops fighting in the German rear. Uh, large amounts of Soviet troops, um, rather than be taken prisoner, went and hid, and they carried on fighting behind enemy lines throughout the war, and gliders were used particularly to supply these guys, and the paratroopers would go with them to help them. You know, the old trained specialist unit. Uh, didn't do very well in Ukraine. The Ukrainians were more than happy to get supplies from the Russians, but they tended to execute the Russian soldiers who were being sent to train them. It's, uh, it's a politics thing. Um, right, um, what have I missed? Nothing, really. All special skills. Uh, in bolt action, you mean? Um, wait, the paratroopers. Um, the, the Russians didn't drop parachutists by glider. Uh, the Russians used gliders usually to drop infantry until after Barbarossa started and then they started dropping parachutists by glider. Um, I don't know why, probably because they'd run out of parachutes. I don't know. Um, but they are landing behind the Pripyat Marshes and I would, I would assume that landing in the Pripyat Marshes with a parachute at night would be lethal. Um, you're just going to disappear into a bog and no one will ever see you again. You just disappear <laughs> straight through it. So landed in a glider. He's landed every B on my. Yeah, so landing in a glider is probably safer to land um, in that particular area of Russia. Um, I've never been, but I've read a lot about the area. Um, and it is not the sort of place you want to land. Um, I went to Ginkel Heath um, in Holland, where the British landed, where a lot of our gliders broke up when we landed and a lot of troops got a bad time landing. Um, Ginkle Heath, I would never ever try to land there with a parachute. Um, I've parachuted before, I would never try and land on the Ginkle Heath, it's a death trap. Um, it's not the best place to land, so if you get somewhere like the Pripyat Marshes would be deadly. Have you parachuted before? Well, parasail, but it's not quite the same thing. What did you do? Well, you get stuck behind a perfectly good motor vehicle and you start driving and suddenly fly into the air and go, ah, <laughs> ah, because no one told you what you were going to do, you know. <laughs> What am I, why am I wearing this harness? Why am I attached to the truck? You know, and you fly into the air and, and you fly around and stuff. Um, did, you, did you scream? What? Did you scream? If I'd have screamed, no one would have heard it because the wind was hitting <laughs> the face so fast along with flies and stuff. You know, the old bumblebee going in my mouth. Um, I was too busy being terrified at the time. No. Actually, it's quite nice. Um, oh, really? No, it's quite nice when you're flying in the air. It's quite fun. I understand why people do pa 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 power thinking, parachuting. Um, I prefer rock climbing because at least then you are attached to earth with a rope. Yeah, and you can't. Yes, yeah. it's always very safe. You know there's a rope there that you're attached to. So this this time it's not, if you don't pull this at this precise second, you can die. Oh, it's nice. Yeah, yeah. It can, it can be dangerous. Um, but no. Um, why does a parachute go wrong? you got to reserve shoot. Well, never, that happens. Like, <laughs> never happens. Never happens. Um, your, your normal shoot will nearly always go. And if it doesn't, your reserve shoot definitely will. So, unless you've been stupid, um, most people who have accidents while parachuting, um, it, it's an attempt to murder. Um, the the suit, suit's been sabotaged by someone. And I'm not making that one up. 
Um, most times when people have actually failed, uh, the shoot's not worked or snapped or whatever, um, it's been, the police have found that it's been uh, tampered with in some way. Either deliberately, stupidly, or some idiot not thinking. Um, but the safety stuff's quite safe. It, it's quite, even in the Second World War, it was actually relatively safe jumping from a parachute. Jumping with a parachute, it was just rather unsafe landing in certain terrain that you don't know about. Most parachutists will parachute over an area where they know where they're going to land. Um, that's, that's just life. You don't want to land in this marsh. You land in a marsh, your feet go straight into the ground, you don't come back up again. Um, next one. Um, trying to think what else I could tell you about it. Um, Soviet Union had large glider clubs before the Second World War. It was very popular. The, the, the Russians actually invented parachuting as a sport. Um, and it was from the Russians. The Russians saw the Russian paratroopers who were first using China in, I think, 37 or 36. I think 36. Um, during the Russian China War. And uh, Russia basically decided they were going to annex bits of China, which is silly. And the Chinese came the other way screaming, blowing trumpets like the Chinese do. And the Russians, the Russians technically won the war, but they, they ended up just drawing the map in the way that the Chinese wanted it rather than the way the Russians wanted it. Because they, the Russians really didn't want to go again. <laughs> the, the Chinese just wouldn't stop fighting. They just, I know too many of the, the, the troops. Many hours. They were fighting against my fleet troops who, who would, will fight to the death. And the Russians weren't really used to that sort of concept. So what? Well, they used to. Well, it'd been for quite yeah, a run. It had been a hundred years or so before they'd had to deal with that. So, um, uh, yeah, they were very good. The, the, the units they were fighting it was one of the armored brigades, the first armored brigade they were fighting against. The Russians hadn't come up against, up against that before. Um, the, the, the communists weren't used to people who had a real army to defend themselves with. Well, they used to. Um, people who didn't have much of an army because it was. The world was not doing particularly well financially, and most countries hadn't spent huge amounts of money on tanks and anti-aircraft guns and soldiers. Um, there were a few belligerent countries, but most of them weren't going to war with Russia at the time. I'm talking about the 1920s, early 1930s, rather than the Second World War, where things were a bit different. What sort of tactics for these guys then? Um, I've never used paratroopers, I've used Japanese paratroopers in games. I've never used Russian paratroopers in games. I would assume they'd be the same as the... Um, uh, not not uh, the, the Japanese. Uh, Apart from the Japanese have bayonets. Well, the Jap well, so did these guys. Um, the Japanese um, tactics were um, that they, they were assault troops, so they would land and raise hell. It's very much like the Soviets were trained to do. Um, they were trained not to, you know, like, you think of when paratroopers are used in in, in, in war films nowadays. Um, they have to capture a bridge and hold the bridge against the evil, nasty German counterattack. Yep. Um, that's not what they were used for by the Russians didn't use them for that. They, they would go to the nearest town and they would take out the mayor and shoot him um, and, and, and raise hell. Um, the Japanese, uh, the troops were designed to take a particular position and, and then wait until the infantry came up, which is quite similar to the way the British used, British and American used power troops. The paratroops would land, take a position, and wait for the army to arrive and relieve them. Um, however, if things went wrong, the Japanese were also trained to act as guerrillas and fight a guerrilla warfare behind the lines. Uh, so that's roughly what the, the Russian paratroopers were used for as well. So there's a lot of crossover in tactics for different reasons. Um, these guys, um, up to 1941, up to Barbarossa, would have been very well trained, very well motivated. They were all volunteers. They had all done either paras paras parachuting in their spare time, not while they were in the army. They were all enthusiasts where every Sunday everyone would go and parachute. Uh, all these people would go. Um, they had a million soldiers with parachute training at the outbreak of the Second World War. Some numbers put it at two million. I think that's slightly fanciful. But there were at least a million Russian soldiers who'd been trained to jump out of a plane. I'm not saying brilliantly, I'm not saying these guys were expert parachute special forces, but they had physically jumped out of a plane before, which is a lot more useful than... First time. Than the guys who had been dropped at Arnhem, who mostly had never jumped out of a plane before. Some, for some of them it was their first drop. So, wow, no wonder we had casualties landing, you know? Um, 
So, anyhow, and he landed in the wrong place, which didn't help. <laughs> Just, like, completely the wrong place. Uh, My tactic? Yeah, uh, by the wrong place, I'll just to qualify that. Um, the best place to land your parachute is, is next to the objective, not seven miles down the road. It's silly landing them there. Um, they were not going to achieve their objectives, so it was never going to happen. So, get over it. Um, right. Tactics. Um, if you're doing a game where you're assaulting with paratroopers, you know, where your paratroopers are actually the guys going in first, are you doing a game where it's all about paratroopers and you're actually going to drop them during the game then try and drop as many close together as you can and land your gliders first see your gliders use two order dice you use your order dice to land with and then the troops inside get their own order dice so your paratroop your, your gliders don't land and you bail out so you so your gliders land and then you bail out. So your troops can activate that turn. Parachutists have the down order on them when they land, don't they? Yeah. Because they've got no weapons or anything. They've got to find their ammo kits and all that sort of stuff. It um, saves your turn. Yeah, so it means that the defensive player is going to have an advantage over you if you use your order dice and land them at the beginning of the turn. I, I get a second turn. Yeah, you see, if you've got a... If you've got, if you're the you're at the end of the turn and and, you, and you've got two order dice left and your enemy doesn't have any order dice left, then feel free to drop your paratroopers then because it means next turn your troops won't be pinned. Uh, sorry, you won't be down. So you can activate them and use them. Whereas if you drop your paratroopers at the beginning of the turn, your enemy is quite likely going to machine gun them or shoot them or drive over them with a truck. So um, you're you're going to be in trouble. Um, Paratroopers are very vulnerable that first turn. Uh, which After is that, they raise help. Which is why I like dropping gliders first, because if you drop your gliders first, your troops can get out of your gliders and cover while, take out the enemy units while the parachute is landing. And also, if you've got a glider team on the battlefield, active, then your enemy is more likely to shoot at the glider than it is to shoot at your defenseless paratroopers. Bear in mind, if you get a lot of casualties landing, um, you're going to have quite a few pin markers on you, mm -hmm. which is going to be pretty unpleasant when you try to activate your unit. Um, you, you're going to have units not activating and going down again, and you can end up with troops pinned for the rest of the game. Yeah. Yeah. So, your tactics? Um, mine is just to hit, 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 attack, attack, attack. So, you don't really think about it, you just drop stuff in and charge. That's what I was going for. Yeah, yeah, no, what I mean is, is how would you drop them? I'd mainly drop them in a defensive area, behind a defensive area or something like that, rather than bang in front of them. So, because no, that yeah. could get them end up seriously bad, like you just said. That could just get pin, pin, pin. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it would be a bullet, a bullet magnet at the, very end, at the beginning of the turn. But we have had games where parachutists haven't ever made it to the objective before the game's over. Because you landed them too far away from the bridge or whatever. Oh, uh, I did land them directly in front of you, and you fired and missed all your bullets. Well, you so had a guy to land on the bridge once. Did you? Oh, you did. Oh, I remember. I, <laughs> I had to do parachutes. Or if I saw that video, yeah, yeah, follow if you're new to the channel. Um, and I missed, and I landed in the river. And half of my par main, the main paratroopers, all of flame flood, multi oh, yes. snipers. All drowned. Yeah, because uh, if you land in the river, you're dead. And there's um, two, oh, yeah. two men made it, and they spent the whole game hiding in the bush. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and you wiped out with flame for a tank. Yeah, yeah. God damn it. That was a good game. That, that was one of, the, one of the few. No, I won that one. For no. sure I did. I must have done. Big, uh, yeah. I ended up with gliders and uh, fresh with gliders. Oh, yeah, that was. Oh, playing Japanese later. So you dropped paratroopers first. And then gliders no, second. No, gliders dead, parachutes. That was yeah, the first so time. Classic. Oh, you, you you did it the other way around then. Yeah, that classic. that was way back when we played Japanese and Chinese, Japanese and stuff. Nearly yeah. a year. Yeah, nearly a year. Anyway, um, not wishing to bog us down in conversation and talky talky. I think I've said enough about this. Um, I have done a lot of research into paratroopers in order to be able to do this particular unit of the army. Um, because of doing early war, that's why I did them because they were. They were used quite a lot of the early war. 
And there's not much about them now because the Russians wanted to forget about it. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like how many people um, do videos on the Battle of Brody. Um, because most people never heard of the Battle of Brody. The biggest tank battle in history. It's cursed now. No, it's not cursed. Cursed, cursed. Why cursed? It's because called the Russians won. Yeah, yeah well, why cursed? The Russians won. That's why cursed. Up Brody. Yeah. The Russians didn't want to talk about Brody because they lost. And it was embarrassing. It was crash. <laughs> yeah, they got totally trashed. They horrifically outnumbered the Germans by about five to one, and they totally lost. You know, it was embarrassing. So they didn't want to talk about it. So they executed the commander and moved on and said, right, that never happened. Let's move on. Let's not worry about it. Um, very bad for being a Russian commander. And the Russian commander, Brody, actually told Stavka that this is silly. It's not going to work. And Stavka said, no, you're wrong. Do it. So he did it. And then they executed him for failing. <laughs> Which is funny because it was their fault. Mm -hmm. I, I never understood the idea of, of, of uh, punishing your officers for doing something that you did wrong. Uh, Note the Mahdi in uh, the um, Golden of Khartoum. Uh -huh. yes. Where he lost half of his cannon. His, 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 jet, his gunner told him, if you position your cannon there, when dawn comes, we'll build it up first and they'll blow our cannon up. And he said, no, 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 I've had a vision who says we're supposed to do this. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah, and, and, then, and then the cannons blew his gun, the, 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 the Gordon's guns blew up the half of Mahdi's cannon. And so I, the he, Mahdi then executed the man for having his... You know, uh, Mahdi had a vision. Yeah, he had one of his visions from God, apparently. And, and then he had My another vision. Back and then he had forth. another vision from God saying that the guy who he'd just executed was right and he should move the guns out of range of, of Gordon's artillery. This, oh, it's pathetic, isn't it, really? And no one points at them and says, hey, this guy's just making it up as he goes along. <laughs> I took a tug to every time. Yeah, he just it. kept doing it. Are you wrong? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gone, I'm right. <laughs> yes, it's always very handy. Um, and the Russians, unfortunately, did suffer from this greatly. Um, all the Germans tended to do when they had a, a, someone make a mistake, um, they would remove them to the officer pool and then they would be put back into the into combat later on. Um, in, the, in the Russian army, if you made a mistake, even if it was your, not your mistake, it was a mistake you'd been ordered to make, um, they, shot said, mistake. they shot you yep. and said it was your fault uh, because your superiors can't be wrong. So it's your fault that it happened. Yes, yes. I could point to a few things going on today that that would apply to, but I'm not going to because I don't wish to be all morbid. Um, yeah, so, um, Soviet paratroopers um, did make up a large part of the Soviet army. The Soviet army was huge, it was the biggest army in the world, uh, and there were a lot of troops trained to be paratroopers. Uh, they were also trained, they were regular infantry, so they were trained to fight on foot. So they were just like um, the British or the German, uh, the, the British paratroopers were called the Stillborn Division because they never actually made a power drop, they spent all their time fighting on foot. Um, until D-Day? No, no, Market Garden, because uh, they, didn't, they didn't land on D-Day, did they? Um, so then you have the, um, the, the uh, German parachutists who, for the most part, after the Battle of Crete, were used as infantry. They weren't used to parachute at all, uh, because it, it's dangerous parachuting and you might get killed. Um, Soviets their battle tactics at the time, which was an offensive army, uh, an, an attacking design, an army designed to attack all the time, parachutists were really important. Defending parachutists aren't at the top of your list, which is why they fell out of use by the Russians and only marginally came back into use by the Russians by the end of the war. Um, perhaps the most used Russian paratroops at the end of the war would have been the ones invading uh, China. Uh, the Japanese occupied China. Uh, they used quite a la large amount, about 2,000 parachutists, to take one of the islands, uh, the Shekelin Islands. Um, they also used them to invade Manchuria, so there were quite a few power drops at that time. I'm not sure if those guys were really trained paratroopers, or whether they were just infantry given a parachute, which is what the Russians did also. <laughs> Um, we need parachutes. We haven't got any. Fine, give these parach parachute pe things to people. You know. Um, so that's it. That, that's really all I've got to say. Um, we have. I, I think we've drawn on a little bit. Um, 
the video is about 30 minutes long. Um, I do apologise for it being 30 minutes long, but there was quite a few little bases to cover. Um, we've done tactics, we've done a little bit about the history of the VDV. Um, anything else you wish to do? No, not think so. Is that it? Oh. So if you want to make your know, paratroopers, they're just straight out of the box. All we did was paint them up uh, in green. Um, you could, we could also, yeah, we could also have painted them, if they're later war, you could paint them in the smocks, the uh, black splotch smocks. But these are early war, so I'm using them for early war, so you know, that's, I just answered my own question there. Um, so that's about it. I will hand you over to my trusty sidekick. Time for you to talk. So if you just for you, please like and subscribe. I uh, put down below whose tactic uh, is better, mine and Imperator's. And if you like the history behind the VDV, that's everything from me. And that's everything from him. Good day. See ya.